a novel idea, read together. We are legal to vote this year. Thank you for being part of this journey with us for the past several weeks as we celebrate Layla, Layla Lalami's award-winning novel, The Other Americans. For the first time in more than a decade, we added a youth addition to a novel idea and have enjoyed exploring author Kelly Yang's delightful novel, Front Desk. If you haven't read it yet, it's well worth the read. This year, uh, even through, through a pandemic, we came together as a community to learn, listen, and understand one another a little bit deeper, and we explored these two wonderful books. We had many partners and esteemed experts from Central Oregon and across the country who led 20 cultural programs. We are grateful for the artists, musicians, and quilters from across Deschutes County who created beautiful art inspired by the book. Cultural programs, including today's author presentation, are free and open to all people in, of Deschutes County. The, the Deschutes Public Library Foundation makes this possible by raising every dollar needed to pay for the programs and the author's visit. We have several generous and loyal sponsors who have been supporting a novel idea for the past 18 years. The Roundhouse Foundation, the E.H. and M.E. Bowerman Advised Fund of the Oregon Community Foundation, and Lonza Pharma and Biotech. In addition to these amazing long-term sponsors, we are pleased to announce generous support from RBC Wealth Management Foundation and the Oregon Cultural Trust. We are always grateful to our bookstore partners, Sun River Books and Music, Barnes and Noble, Herringbone Books, Polina Springs Books, and Roundabout Books. We are fortunate to have the incredible group of community readers from across Deschutes County who bring forth books for the final advisory committee to read and review. Together, our local readers and the advisory committee help the library decide the best book for our communities, and we are grateful for their dedication. So questions for this event, please post your questions in the chat uh, by 4.40 p.m. We'll be, gather them and have them ready for question and answer session following the conversation between Jason Graham and Layla Lalami. So on to the main event. Uh, tonight, we have a treat for you. It is an honor to introduce our host for the evening, Jason McNeil Graham, also known as the artist Mosley Wada. He is a Windy City Heartland transplant living in Central Oregon. Graham's work spans nearly two decades of explora exploration in multiple mediums, including writing, painting, performance, and video. Additionally, Jason has led interviews with Michael Pollan, Yah Jesse, Leila Lalami, Dave Eggers, T. Geronimo Johnson, and Jimmy Santiago Baca, among others. As a performance artist, he has opened for Buddy Wakefield, Saul Williams, Poet Laureates, Anise Mojgani, uh, Elizabeth Woody, and Kim Stafford. Terry Tempest Williams, The Indigo Girls, Michael Fronte, and several others. Jason works in dedicated collaboration with longtime friend and multi-instrumentalist and producer and sound designer, Colton Tyler Williams. Tonight, we bring him back in conversation with author Layla Lalami. And now, I have the pressure, <laughs> pressure and pleasure to introduce the 18th Annual Novel Idea award-winning author, Layla Lalami. Born and raised in Morocco, Layla is a writer steeped in the past and present of her homeland, an outspoken advocate for immigrants, women, and people of color. Lalami tackles complex questions of identity, Islamophobia, and belonging in essays for the New York Newsweek, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, the Nation, and the New York Times. Her novel, The Moore's Account, was a finalist for the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, won the Hurston Wright Legacy Award for African American Fiction, and was long-listed for the Man Booker Award and the International Impact Dublin Literary Award. Her most recent novel, The Other Americans, was the 2019th 
finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction. Lalamy's, uh, Lalamy's latest release is Conditional Citizens, a nonfiction book about citizenship and belonging in America that was long listed for the two, 2021 Carnegie Medal for Nonfiction and, in my estimation, a must read. Lalamy is a is a recipient of Simpson Joyce Carol Oaks Prize, Morocco's prestigious Wissam Medal, a British Council Fellowship, a Fulbright Fellowship, a Lannan Foundation Residency Fellowship, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. She is currently a professor of creative writing at the University of California at Riverside. Ladies and gentlemen, Jason Graham and Layla Lalami. It's weird not to hear applause after that, is it not? Can, like, just, <laughs> uh, I hadn't anticipated asking you this qu question. Actually, this question I did anticipate asking you. How are you? I'm well. <laughs> Thank you very much for asking. How about you, Jason? It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. I'm uh, fastly outpacing you in the gray hair department, for sure. <laughs> You think? Yeah, <laughs> but, like, you yeah no, 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 I'm not. But I've seen some things. Um, I wanted to know, um, after such a long list like that, where you're hearing your name attached to these awards that are prestigious, maybe very much things that at some point you wanted to achieve and then you do achieve, and then people know you as the author and the teacher, and you go up, you know, you become in a sense almost less of a person in our eyes as you sort of rise in rank and put on the pedestal. How do you deal with that as a writer? Do you have to dismiss that completely? Do you have to, what does it do to your focus? This is a really interesting question. Uh, and it reminds me of um, something somebody said to me the other day, exactly this, you know, how um, I was saying how I was having trouble with whatever I was working on, a project I was writing. And this person seemed surprised, you know, uh, you know, a person who, who's published five books and who's, you know, won a bunch of prizes mm -hmm. um, shouldn't feel this way. And the reality is you still feel this way. Every, it doesn't matter what the recognition is, uh, what the prizes are, what institutions grant you their support or their approval. Every day, the process remains the same. I have to face a blank page. I have to create something out of nothing. That doesn't change, and the pressure remains the same. If anything, the pressure is <laughs> is even bigger. Yeah. Um, and I think what has happened over the years is I have gained some experience so that when I face the blank page, I at least have the benefit of the experience of knowing that all it takes is actually sticking with the process and, and sitting at that chair and not giving up. And yes, even if it's, if you end up not writing any words today, maybe tomorrow it'll be 200 words and maybe the day after that it'll be 2000, who knows, but the process has to be the same. And experience has taught me to trust in the process. Um, yeah. When I hear, to be honest with you, when I hear my bio, you know, read like that, I always feel vaguely embarrassed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do. I, it feels like it feels like there is this uh, person who is uh, not me, <laughs> yeah. who is, um, you know, has all these prizes or institutional support. Whereas I think of myself as that person facing that blank page. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. there's like a public person and then there is the private person and the private person is who I am every day and what I have to do every day and the, and the work that I still have in mind to achieve uh, during the time that I have left. <laughs> yeah. This, this is actually um, a question that Liz uh, Goodrich of Deschutes Public Library was asking before uh, when we were just talking on the screen, and I need to credit her for crafting some of these questions as well. <clears throat> but how do you traverse this world between the sort of, I don't know if this is quite accurate here, but like the hyper, hyper introvert, uh, very much sort of cloistered off as a writer myself, I need my alone time, I need to be in this particular space so that these worlds and these voices can emerge. Uh, and then you have to 
talk about your book or advertise it, or hopefully people are interested enough in the work that you're doing that you're able to go out in the world. But those are completely different muscles that you have to exercise. So how do you navigate between those two? Because the work that you're doing, and we absolutely have to get to your books here, but the work that you're doing demands that you take it out to people because it's exactly people that you're talking about. And, and these are necessary uh, stories and essays that you're writing. So you're not really allowed. I don't feel like you have permission to just kind of sit on them, right? <laughs> like you have to get it out there. Right. I mean, I think that um, the purpose is to share it with people. If I didn't want to share it with people, I would keep it in my diary. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, no, I mean, I the, the purpose of getting it published is to share it with other, uh, with readers and with other people in the world. It's interesting, I think, because uh, again, through experience, I've learned that there are boundaries between that public and that uh, private part of being uh, uh, a writer. So, for example, while I'm working on a project, a book that I'm working on, it's going to take several years, I have learned not to share anything about that project. So people will ask, well, what's it about? And I always resist the impulse to say what it is about or talk about. I don't talk about it at all. I don't even talk about it to my husband who mm -hmm. reads <laughs> much of what I write. I, I try as much as possible to keep it to myself so that there is that world is preserved for me so that I, it's a place where I can be free. I can explore. I can just do what I want with that work. And once I'm done with it, once I'm pleased with it and it leaves my desk, so to speak, and goes to my editor, and then that whole part of the process starts. And then then that sort of uh, public person has to step in and, and talk about the book and yeah. get interested and go on book tours. And you know, and then that public part of the job sort of begins. But up until that point, I have learned that it's really necessary to maintain that sort of boundary between the two. While the work is in progress, I don't discuss it, for example. Uh, and I, I, I absolutely uh, treasure the time that I have alone. One of the reasons that um, I think I have um, spent so much of my life writing is because I actually enjoy being alone in a room. Yeah. Uh, and while I enjoy being around other people too, I still, you know, I need a certain number of hours each day where I'm just alone. And I, uh, and, and so I've, so, so I guess what I'm saying is I've tried to, I, I, I've learned to treasure that and to, to protect it at all costs. So yeah. everything in my life, I try to organize around the few hours a day that I'm going to have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, then you try, you try to explain this to your loved ones or whatever or whatever. And you're not necessarily alone. I mean, we say alone, but this is very much a, a dialogue. It's a place that, I mean, maybe this is not true for you, but I find that there's quite a few voices in, in the aloneness. So I never really feel as though I'm just by myself, especially when I'm creating the world. I think, I think it's important to acknowledge that no one um, creates a work of art uh, and brings it out into the world to share with others without the benefit of, uh, of help from a bunch of other people. So yeah. you can see sort of like the book, the physical yeah. object, and it has your one name on it. But in reality, of course, it, 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 it involves uh, so many other people not least, you know, the family who's there to support you through several years and, and you know, of, of the work and through the doubts and through the drafts and, yes. uh, and then the editor and then the agent <laughs> and the publicist yeah. and, you know, the marketers and, the, you know, there's like, there's a whole team behind it and people don't necessarily see that because they see the name on the book. And, but I do think that um, in, in, producing sort of a work of art that there is always a community behind it. It's never mm -hmm. just the one person, even if it is one person's name attached to it. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is, um, well, th this is a solid segue. I have a different cover than you have. Hold up the one yes, that you have. the paperback, yeah. Yeah, oh, I see, you have the hardback. Yeah. Um, how did you come to write The Other Americans? Because you were just talking about 
line, lineage, really you're, there's also ancestry involved in what you're talking about as well. So how did you come to write The Other American? Well, I, you're right. It is a great, uh, a great segue to discuss the book because the book started out for me, I had just turned in the copy edits for my previous books and I was actually on on vacation and, and I found out while I was on vacation that my father had uh, uh, gotten gravely ill and so I had to scramble and travel to Morocco and be with him and, um, you know, sort of nurse him back to health. And when I came back to the States, I really realized how much the, the uh, decision to uh, immigrate to the United States had affected not just me, but the community uh, where I had been raised. So primarily my family, right? So my parents couldn't really have, I, I couldn't support them when they had crises like this because I was uh, 6,000 miles away. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, by the way, during the pandemic, a number of people had that experience, right, of being forced to be away from their loved ones. And that is something that uh, every immigrant has had to to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so I thought about writing a book in which, um, you know, some kind of event like has an effect on a wider community. And I wasn't sure really what to use for it. And it so happened that that same summer there had been a spate of hate crimes against Muslims in the U.S. And I thought of putting the two ideas together. I also had been spending some time in the desert. Um, my husband and I would go uh, backpacking and uh, camping in, in the desert. And so um, all of these ideas, the personal, the, the sort of uh, uh, the political, the, 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 the physical, like the, the, the enjoyment of being outdoors, all of these ideas kind of coalesced into um, the story of the other Americans, which begins with this uh, tragic hit and run. Yeah. And yeah. A crisis. Uh, yeah, it's a crisis. And basically the family that's at the center is brought together again. And, you know, the book basically explores the 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 the, the impact of this crisis <clears throat> on not just the family, but on the whole community. So that that is um, that is what the book is about. Well, but and as you just said, it isn't and you could have done so to just have one or two people. And granted, there's you've got sort of leading characters in and amongst these nine, but why did you choose to tell the story through these nine perspectives, these nine characters? So initially when I did the first uh, draft of the book, I had only three perspectives. It was the Nora, who's the mm -hmm. musician, uh, whose father is, uh, is killed in the hit and run, and then um, the detective who's investigating mm -hmm. the crime and Nora's love interest, Jeremy. And I felt like that was enough to sort of cover the ground that I wanted to cover. Yeah, but yeah. because it was only three perspectives, I often, I basically had written myself almost in a corner because I couldn't bring in the fact that there was a witness that hadn't come forward because obviously the detective doesn't know that there is a witness, mm -hmm. nor does the daughter know. So it was kind of like making it difficult for me to move elements of the story. Um, and I couldn't really um, explore the, the, the other side of the crime, meaning from the perspective of the person who has committed the crime, like who was that person? Yeah. Why would they do such a thing? And so, but the book still was exactly the same book, except that it was from three perspectives and it had a beginning, a middle and an end. <laughs> and it seemed like it was a solid draft. And so I turned it into my editor and it was really through his questions to me about what the book was trying to achieve, which was to explore this, the impact on this community that I realized I really had to expand the, the, number of perspectives and to allow myself um, to do something that was really scary for me, which is to write it from, from so many different perspectives, uh, some, of, some of which I, I had never considered or that I didn't have any wow. kind of a connection with that would be very difficult to write. And so I kind of, I think there was a little bit of fear and a little bit of you know trepidation and so but I decided to give it a go and so in the process of revising uh through 
for the for the following few years as I revised the book that it slowly expanded to nine and I settled on the nine because I obviously wanted the family to be at the center the families the four family members the Mm -hmm. mother father and the two daughters and then of course I wanted the witness and I wanted the detective because that was part of you know the story begins with what happened on that on that desert road so it was important to bring that in and then of course you know the love interest and then the people who are involved in this crime you know uh what is their role in all of this and how is you know how is everybody impacted and so that's how the book really grew out of that those questions with my editor that conversation that single conversation that I had with him (laughs) I remember it took place I was I was at the airport I was waiting to catch a flight and he was we were talking on the phone and and that is um that it, it was during that conversation that that it just those questions uh were raised for me. And so I got on the flight and I remember on the back of the boarding pass, I started thinking, okay, well, you know, obviously, you know, I'm going to write from the perspective of each of these family members, but if I were curious, who else might I write about? And I started like Mm -hmm. thinking through some of these characters and, and, and writing from their perspectives, which some were came easily and others, you know, not so easily. Well, there's a couple of things there. One, I want to ask you, like, who is difficult to write about? But then also, too, that surprises me, not the fear part that you spoke about, but it surprises me that it would be that you aren't always actually considering from multiple perspectives, particularly those that might not come easy to you. Because uh, in Conditional Citizens, I feel like, and this is commented on the on actually the back uh, cover, but the clear-eyed and even way that you're approaching things, I deeply appreciate right now, especially as, um, you know, it's very easy, it, it's always been easy, I suppose, but to to have these huge reactions. Um, so it kind of surprises me to hear that, that 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 is an almost just second nature for you to be considering um, these other perspectives, because they're so well, clearly illustrated in your writing. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It's it, I guess I should rephrase that. It's not so much that I didn't consider these perspectives. Yeah. That the question is whether to write from these perspectives. Mm-hmm. Meaning, you you obviously in writing the story, you're thinking about it from multiple angles. You're thinking about who the characters are and how they're behaving within this small, like this miniature world. Yeah, uh, that I've created, but to actually decide in whose voice I, you know, the the author is going to speak, in whose voice am I going to speak, whose voice am I going to take on in the book, that is the challenge. Yeah, and I yeah. I found it harder. So the ones that came a little bit more easily for me, for example, were um, Mariam, the mother, uh-huh. uh, who's an immigrant from Morocco and who is kind of an older woman and she's you know watched her daughters grow and her daughters are adults now and she she's she's in her mind she sacrificed everything to keep her family together but that isn't how life worked out so that was an interesting perspective and then the 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 converse the the flip side of that is the daughter who doesn't want to be tied with tied down by the expectations that her mother's has of her and wants to just be this musician. So those were the most interesting for me to write, most, you know, um, most easily available, I would say. Uh-huh. But the most challenging one was definitely the one of, uh, well, two. One is the perspective of AJ, which I found very difficult to write because yeah. um, it is somebody that I, uh, in real life, I would have had a very hard time interacting with, and I, I am sure I would perhaps be. Um, I, I would want to keep my distance. Let's put it this way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that person is still part of our world, whether I want to keep my distance from them or not. And so, in creating kind of this this 
the world of this novel and seeing how the, the, the event at the center of it might take place. It was important to know how, what role he played in it. And so it was really a challenge. And I think the key for me in writing that character is the realization that nobody thinks of themselves um, as a bad person. Everyone thinks of themselves yes. as a good person. And so yeah. the voice that you use to sort of narrate your life to yourself is maximally empathetic it just it's maximally justifying mm -hmm. so in other words uh people might say well you know some people might think i'm racist but i'm not i'm yeah. just asking questions <laughs> or they might you know there's always this sort of like this this um strain of self-justification yes. in the way in which we narrate our own lives and so so wow. that was very helpful well to said. me to realize <laughs> that he would he would use a voice in which he was, whether consciously or unconsciously, just justifying his actions and claiming to the bitter end that he was innocent. And yes. so that was one realization. And then the other realization is that as unpleasant as it might seem, um, that we have more in common as human beings with a character like that than we might wish to acknowledge. Oh, I, I, this is maybe one thing too that was that is potentially dangerous about writing that and writing it as well as you did because as a reader, right, I'm putting myself, whoever the main character is at that right. moment, into that. Right. And I started, I was from chapter to chapter, depending on who the characters were, but once I'm reading AJ, I become AJ, right. all of a sudden, I'm sort of like, yeah, this guy, what, you know, <laughs> what's the big, like, what's the big deal here, right? And the constant minimizing, um, and that is a really terrifying thing that is happening, this sort of denialist approach to things, this minimizing thing uh, that happens, and that is so alive in that character. And yeah. then I also get, the other thing that was difficult about it, thankfully, was I wasn't able to uh, strip him of his humanity either, because now I'm seeing myself as him, possibly that's also why. But he's not just some, you know, whatever, we insert monster here or whatever. He's not just a monster. You right. Know. Yeah. That, that's precisely what I was getting at, is that it would be so easy to write a character like that as a monster. And to yes. do that, I would, for example, have to switch to the third person. Yeah. Then he becomes he. And so by by if I were to use the third person, uh, that would create a distance between me as the author and this character yeah. on the one hand and between the reader and this character on the other hand. So yeah. everybody is safe in their corners and they can go ahead and judge this person as being a monster with whom they have nothing in common. It was far more challenging and to my mind, far more interesting to use the first person in the same way as with the other characters. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that ethically, the, the choice that I made was to kind of limit um, his chapters to, I think it was three. And the reason behind that yeah, is, yeah. I'm trying to see what it's like to be this person and to give a glimpse into how that person might think about themselves and how they might see the world. Mm -hmm. And that glimpse is enough. I'm not interested in creating, in creating a, an entirely sympathetic uh, uh, character because there is a limit to uh, tolerance. When yes, we tolerate yes. so much of what others are doing, then we slide into intolerance. And yes. we're tolerance so in other words by by sort of using the first person but limiting it to a certain number of uh chapters and um sort of like working through the rest of the narrative to make it clear for example from the daughter's perspective where she stands on this then it leaves it up to the reader to decide but you but but hopefully the world is still has a kind of morality to it if i don't know if i'm explaining this correctly no no i think you are but, yeah but but so that's the idea and so so then with him it, i i really wasn't interested in having him be you know a monster and to have him like i don't know what be different from us and so one of the choices for example was to have him be close to his mother which is something that nora has a really difficult uh, time with yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, he loves animals and uh -huh. you know uh you know like there's all kinds of things about him that 
you might easily think he's like the guy next door, the nice guy. And then suddenly, you know, you discover something happens and you discover, wait a minute, something's not actually quite right about this guy. Something's off and uh, it's in the last chapter. And that's when you start to realize that, uh, well, maybe there is, it wasn't really an accident and maybe there's more to it. But I think also, and well, not but, but uh, additionally, I think what you're doing is allowing us to see, and this is what you talk about in Conditional Citizens, uh, you're allowing us to see the individual as opposed to just him being consumed by uh, the group or just the monolithic right. thing. And I feel like this is such an important place to go because you're, where you're placing the attack actually I feel like isn't on this character, AJ, um, but is, it is really on what happens when we allow and AJ, if you like, to become just some sort of generalized figure that represents an entire group, which um, there is so much, there is so, I, I do want to clunkily uh, segue to conditional citizens because I want to pay attention to time. I um, want to know how these books go together because these two, I'm going to do some placement marketing here because these, <laughs> These two books, <laughs> yes, these these two books right here, uh, because they so clearly do go together in my mind. And then one thing that you seem to um, rage against is the wrong way to say it, but the one thing that you make perfectly clear is how nuanced things are. That we cannot simply put up these broad borders. That we're all, often looking at uh, the wrong sort of or st the wrong sort of statistics or the right statistics in the wrong places. Um, that so often your experience has been to speak on behalf, the impossible uh, task of speaking on behalf of an entire people or an entire uh, terrorist organization or something like this. There's this character of the, um, the real person of the woman in the blue pantsuit, yes, that I think, unfortunately, I deeply identify with. I don't want to admit to myself that I've often been that person who's like, you know, the equivalent of I have a black friend or whatever, whatever, uh, and, but is, also a very, you know, kind person, we can assume maybe just like deep, deeply in, ignorant in what they're asking. But I want to um, ask you, what is the question? How these two books go together here? Because they do seem to clearly connect, if you can help me with my rambling uh, question. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a good question. It's, it reminds me of what happened when um, the novel came out, which I think it came out in March 2019. Mm -hmm. And one of the first questions that I started fielding, even before publication, was whether this book was a commentary on uh, the Trump administration and what was called Trump's America. And I was mystified by this because I had started working on the book in 2014 and I had never, you know, I honestly wasn't even aware of who Trump was other than his reality TV show. So I, I just didn't know. And um, when, the, when he was elected, I mean, I was, I was in the middle of working on the book and nothing changed that the, everything about the book happened in a pre-Trump um uh, world. So it was set in 2014 and that didn't change. Yeah. Conditional citizens, however, so in other words, everything that you see in the book, any any commentary that you see about communities in the US had nothing to do with the Trump administration. Conditional citizens, on the other hand, I think of it as the book that I wrote during this administration because I started working on it during the Trump administration. And it is in some sense a very, well, one, obviously one is a novel and was a collection of essays and they're very mm -hmm. different. And what I would say is that while they share the same interest in um, America as I see it, which is as a multicultural country with uh, a very specific history that explains sort of the present moment that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, the difference between the two, I would say, is that in the other Americans, my job as I see it, or as I saw it, was to create these characters and bring them to life and uh, investigate their emotional lives and put that and make that real on paper. Conditional Citizens is less interested in the emotional lives of anybody and more interested in sort of uh, how, as citizens, we relate to one another. And citizenship is kind of a, um, a, 
so, so it's a form of belonging and it's a political form of belonging, right? Because mm -hmm. nations are political organizations. It's a, 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 a political communities. And so to be a citizen of a nation is kind of a political um, relationship that you have with that nation and with other members of that community. So they're very different books because one, um, at the same time as they have a lot in common, but one of the things that they have uh, that, that is very different is that in the first one, it really is about uh, writing without judgment as much as possible, the lives, the emotional lives of, of characters, whereas the other one is more interested in really investigating how people interact with one another um, in the real world and really me exercising a lot more judgment and being a lot more blunt and upfront about um, how I see the world around me. Mm. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's a different, they rely on different, they're interested in the same thing, I think, yeah. which is cool. <laughs> yes. But one is looking at people as members of a society and the other one is looking at people as members of a nation state. And so in the second one, uh, I'm, ex I'm filling in a lot of the background in terms of like history and um, uh, the current events. I mean, it's using a different set of, a different context for it. Sure, it, well, and a nonfiction collection of essays as opposed to a work of fiction, both right. containing the truth. Uh, obviously, um, uh, I do want to let folks uh, know. I really don't. I'm not the biggest fan of time. I'm not. I have to be honest here. As far About as time. <laughs> yeah, as far as constructs go, race and time not always my favorite. <laughs> um, but uh, we do need folks to submit their questions. Um, this is pretty much the time that they need to do that. And um, in a moment here, we're going to transition into the Q and A. Can Todd's actually sitting right over here. We made it look like he was in some other sort of wing of the library, but I'm just going to turn to Todd. Todd, can I ask another question? Can I? No, please. Okay, yeah. all right. It's okay with Todd. <laughs> okay, um, there was, um, great, 15 minutes, you said? Great. Um, there was several very personal moments um, in conditional citizens, and one of those was talking about um, the clinical dementia uh, that you were experiencing with your mother-in-law. And um, which is, I, I think actually, I'm really glad that you decided to bring in this deeply personal part for a variety of reasons. One is because I think it clearly gives us a connection to uh, what is often our realities when we are uh, having to care for our families. It's something that I'm experiencing in my family right now and on and on. The other reason why I'm very glad that you brought that up is because this is a clinical type of forgetfulness, but then you also definitely are talking about this sort of cultural amnesia that is part and parcel with being an American. The, and even just saying American reflects that because I'm, the assumption is United States of America, not South America, North America, what have you. So um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your observations uh, when it comes to that kind of forgetfulness and why you oftentimes are put in the position to remind us, um, for example, you know, uh, let's make America great again was not uh, a Trump original, right? Which to my delight I found in this book. So could you talk a little bit about your experiences observing forgetfulness? Right, I, I, this came up because I was thinking back about my, uh, citizenship ceremony. So I was sworn in in July 2000 at the Pomona Fairplex, which is a which is a 437 square foot facility uh, in Los Angeles County and is traditionally the site of the LA County Fair. So every summer you can go there and well pre-pandemic anyway and you could go there and there was a petting zoo and you could buy churros and there's rides and it's a lot of fun. It's a place where families get together every summer and it's it's a lot of fun. And it was also the place where I was sworn in in July 2000. And I was thinking about it because 20 years had passed since that ceremony. And it seemed like, you know, as I started working on this book, I was thinking, wow, you know, it's like 20 years have passed. It's passed by in the blink. And I was just thinking about that 
that uh, citizenship ceremony and what it meant to me to become an American. So few people get to choose to, uh, to be a citizen of any nation. Citizenship is so random. It's kind of a lottery of birth. Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm. you are born determines a number of the rights that you have access to. So for example, you could be born in North Korea and that means you don't have um, freedom of movement. Or you can be born in say, Saudi Arabia and not have freedom of religion. Or you can be born, you know, so it just yeah. uh, is, is in this completely random where you are born, but that determines a number of the rights that you're going to have as an individual. Uh, and so I was just thinking about the fact that I consciously chose to become a U.S. citizen. And so I was thinking mm -hmm. about that day in, at the Pomona Fairplex. And as I was looking up the facility, uh, because I was trying to determine where it was, really, just so I could have a line in the essay about that facility, I was shocked to discover that it had served as a, an assembly center for Japanese Americans in 1942. It was where Japanese Americans in Southern California were supposed to report prior to being placed on trains and uh, taken to internment camps. Uh, and so I almost fell out of my chair. I, I thought, I, I, what? I, 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 they, did they seriously swear and continue to this day to swear new citizens at a place where United States citizens were treated as enemy aliens and taken to internment camps? Did, is that what's happened? Yeah. And, and then I started reading about the history of that place and how, you know, the assembly center is, is a parking lot and there's, there was no marker for it. And it, it just struck me how much of uh, nation building and is based on, on forgetting and more than forgetting is based on erasure. Like these are yes. parts that, that, that it is best not to talk about and it is better to focus on things and national myths like a nation of immigrants or things mm -hmm. like the American dream, rather than talking about this is a nation that is based on settler colonialism. There were people here in this country before the arrival of white settlers. And, and oh, we you know, just heard it, that recently, right? That was yeah. just, I mean, <laughs> and, yeah. and you know, the idea that it's a nation of immigrants when for most of its history, you know, it had very strict laws about who could come and legally immigrate and have access to citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just struck by that erasure. And the event that was happening in my life in 2000, the thing that was occupying most of my time was my mother-in-law's uh, dementia because it was something that had to be managed on a daily basis. Yes. Uh, and so then it just, you know, it just hit me that the two, you know, that there is a connection because my mother-in-law was essentially my adopted mother. She was somebody that, uh, despite all the cliches, I got along very well with my mother-in-law and I cared for her very much. And so we were very close. Um, and she was like a second mother to me in the mm. same way that the United States is an adopted country for mm. me. Wow. And so it was, you know, it, it just really fascinated me how much of belonging is dependent on, on erasure. And so the, in that chapter, I basically talk about some of the erasures that have led to, um, to, to the notion of Americanness, to what we consider being American. Mm -hmm. I wonder, as you said, that daily management, I don't know if you use the word management, but that sort of daily attendance to, I feel like this is actually a daily practice, and I think you even say in the book, <clears throat> maybe towards the end, but a lifetime's work of uh, sort of revealing or chipping away at or bringing to attention the fact that we are constantly participating right. in this sort of forgetful as apple pie uh, culture. Right, and I think it's because so much of it is repeated for us every day, you know, yeah whether it's on the news or whether it's on, uh, I was just watching a TV series that's set in outer space, but the, the characters have like engaged in this, like incredibly, like I, 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 there's no other word for it, nationalistic display. And it's just like, there's so much in our culture that really uh, goes to how great America is. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, so, so it, all of that, that constant refrain of, 
you know, the greatest nation in the history of the world or the greatest nation right. in the world or the richest right. nation in the world or the strongest nation in the world. And yeah. that constant uh, sloganeering that we hear in the news, whether it's in the mouths of politicians, which is not subtle, or whether it is, um, as I said, in forms of popular entertainment where it is perhaps more subtle there, but that yeah, maybe. is an active act. Um, it's a, it's an act that encourages uh, forgetting and erasure, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. It's, because you, so you kind of, I guess what I'm saying is you have to almost consciously work against it if you want to remember. Yes, but then like once you see and once you begin seeing, how do you walk around and just interact with other people? Do you, do like I was watching How to Train Your Dragon 2, for example. <laughs> I like this transition <laughs> already. I love it. And I like the the only the only like dark character, skin tone, melanin, dark the, the black dude with dreads with the voiceover Jamon Hunsu, he's the villain. But all the Vikings, the Vikings, they're good. And so like I'm like the worst anymore when it comes to holidays or when it comes to like going out and enjoying something. Are you able to just like function? Like can you just celebrate, I don't know, uh St. Patrick's Day. I don't know. Like, take your pick. Like, can you can you just enjoy things? Like, you had brought up, um, what was it, the freedom pie or something, and like the hamburger and the lemonade that you eat. Can, are you allowed to like enjoy these things anymore? Because you seem like you really also have a great time. Like, you seem like you also are really enjoying the life that you're living. But then you have all this like stuff that you see. How do you navigate those worlds? Uh, so I take it you have young children. Uh, how to train your Dragon too. Yeah, I mean, let's. Yeah, yeah. To be fair, so, I probably watch so, it on my own, but. So just so you know, my daughter refuses to watch documentaries with me, like because, <laughs> because it's I'm constantly pausing and I'm giving historical context, and yeah. it's just, it drives her crazy. Yeah. It drives her crazy because I don't let her watch anything in peace. So yeah. I have learned. <laughs> like you brought up Tintin, and I make my kids read Tintin, but I'm like, this is racist. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I think that. Human beings are extraordinarily adept at holding two ideas in our heads at the same time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that you can watch a, like a musical like Hamilton mm -hmm. and recognize that the actors are phenomenally talented, that the songs are catchy, that everything about it is just expertly rendered. Yeah. But at the same time, I know that it is not history Mm. that it's a fantasy and that uh, that as a fantasy, it serves a particular purpose. So you can do those things. And I think that that's what makes our brains function the way that they do, that we are able to hold those two ideas together. So by all means, enjoy your popular entertainment. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying, you know, take time to remember that there's also this other thing and, and um and question it uh, where possible. Yeah, the um... and create your own. You know, I mean, I wish I I don't have Lin Manuel Miranda's talent <laughs> for writing musicals, but if I did, it, there might I might have written my own musical. Yeah, and I think that that's an important um, thing that you're bringing up, and just a reminder to whoever I mean, we must have writers on here who are listening that that is part of what is the magic is that you do have the ability to create and but I also appreciate there is some uh, you have to be cautious you know to a certain extent um, with the understanding that other people are likely going to listen to you um, I do want to uh, ask you about I really enjoyed uh, when you were discussing in conditional citizens the gray zone mm -hmm. and leaning into this um, living in multiple places and having multiple thoughts and being of multiple identities. Um, and I was wondering about that and, and maybe I could just leave it there, but maybe if you could talk a little bit about the gray zone and what that, what that is. <laughs> um, is, so that too, is that too broad? No, no, not at all. I, I just, I, the reason I chuckled bec is because this is a term that has gained in currency over the last few years, and we owe it to uh, the PR department of ISIS. Yeah. Um, and so it always kind of makes me a little, 
I chuckle because the idea that there is a PR department to, to ISIS, but there is in fact such a thing. I know, I, I wonder about this too with like a, a Klan rally or Proud Boys or something like that. And again, I'm not trying to invite. Must. <laughs> but like, that requires a lot of admin. Like who's doing the admin, you know? I like wonder about that stuff, yeah. But you think your job is hard. Try being the PR for those guys, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't want to get out. Uh, I wonder if you and I will ever be invited back to talk about this stuff. <laughs> we shall see. <laughs> so just briefly about the gray zone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A few years ago, I, um, I was asked to write a piece for the New York Times Magazine, uh, and it was about, uh, I believe it was about a bombing in Paris that by the forces of ISIS in which a number of people had died. It was, I think, an, an outdoor entertainment venue yeah. uh, or maybe indoor entertainment venue. Um, and in the process of writing that essay is how I came across this uh, piece that had appeared in the ISIS magazine. And it talked about the gray zone, which mm -hmm. according to ISIS is uh, sort of the way that it that ISIS looks at the world is in uh, black and white. So yes. basically on one side is the side of ISIS mm -hmm. and on the other side is the side of the so-called uh, crusaders. Mm -hmm. And uh, that basically Muslims had to decide which side they were on and that, that you couldn't say, well, I'm not on the side of or W. Bush, and I'm not on the side of ISIS. You couldn't say that. You had basically in in the view of ISIS, you the, the attacks of September 11th were designed to make clear to the world that there was no in between, that it was pick a side and that's it. Uh, and, Which is exactly what you illustrate was our response as well. Oh yeah, for sure. But yeah. so, but but you know, it's our just meaning was, United States of America's response, I right? As a government, yeah. right? Yeah, as a <laughs> and, government, yeah. Yeah, and so it, it just struck me as such a disturbing view of the world because so much, none of us are one thing ever. Yeah, thank you. Ever, yeah. because like identity is not a fixed thing. It's it's this, uh, first of all, it's dynamic and it's also, um, it's constantly evolving. We're multiple things and each of those things evolves also over time and, and through experiences and, and everything. And so the idea that I had to pick, it just was very troubling. And I, so the essay is really about how much I actually love the gray zone. Yes. And the gray zone is where I want to be. I, I have no interest in being, you know, in one side or another. In fact, I, I, I find it uh, often troubling if I'm, um, in a place where everyone thinks the same or everyone looks the same or everyone acts the same. Yeah. It's just, there's a little, it, it's, I think that there is a lot more joy to be found in that gray area, a lot more uh, to learn from that gray area uh, and a lot more growing to be done in that gray area. Yeah. Uh, and that's what the essay was about. Okay. Very well <laughs> said. Um, not surprisingly, uh, we have to, I just want, uh, I want to push on authors that I interview periodically, you being one of them, like a friendship, which is highly inappropriate, I think. But there is um, never enough time, and I wish I could, not actually asking for your phone number, just call you up <laughs> and just be like, oh, so what do you think about this, blah, blah, blah. But there's other people um, who have questions, and, um, and I'd, like to, I'd like to get to that if, if we can transition to that. Um, is that right? All grown-ups yeah, involved? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Um, let's go back to this uh, first question, which was like really uh, sweet, actually. But it was something about uh, stories that were important to you from your younger childhood years, I believe. Do you have um, some favorite stories from being a kiddo? In my younger and more vulnerable years, um, a number. And actually, it's interesting that you mentioned Tintin because that was my favorite uh, comic book when I was a little girl. I read every single issue of, of Tintin and uh, loved them. Um, also, Asterix, you know, all, the, all yep. those French yep. comics, basically. Yep. Actually, yep. Tintin was written by somebody from Belgium. But anyway, yep. Yep. <laughs> all of those French comics, um, a lot of French literature was what I was exposed to as a child because of the way in which the book market 
uh, functioned in Morocco in the 1970s. So it was dominated by French publishers. And mm -hmm. um, so I read, you know, things like The Three Musketeers and uh, Jules Verne's and, you know, all of the the fantasy, the sci-fi novels that, that, that he was writing for young adults, um, like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea mm -hmm. and, and so forth. And then later, um, as a, as a middle schooler, I started reading more Moroccan authors. So personal favorites of mine were, for example, Mohamed Choukri, who wrote a book called uh, For Bread Alone, uh, Fatima Mernisi, who's been an inspiration for me really all my life. And um, let's see, Leila Abu Zaid uh, and Dries Shraibi, who was also another favorite. He wrote a book called The Simple Past, and a number of books, but that one in particular, I remember, is being really hitting me with the force of revelation. So mm -hmm. I would say uh, um, it's it's been a journey, basically. A lot of, I would say, comic books was how I really started reading as a very young kid, and then, you know, young adult, lots of French stuff there. Then some Moroccan literature, and really in college, I majored in English, and that's when I started reading English language um, fiction. Yeah. Uh, that question was from Noah. Um, this question from Michelle, um, what are you currently reading or are there authors that we should be paying attention to right now? I'm smiling because I just received an advanced review copy of uh, Jonathan Franzen's The Corrections mm -hmm. and it's like 550 pages. I just started reading it last night. So uh, that's what I'm reading right at this minute. But uh, let me see, what did I read? Let me look at my little notebook. <laughs> mm. What am I reading right now? Um, I actually have read a number of books because I'm teaching. So I have to reread the books that I'm teaching. So The Metamorphosis, Waiting for the Barbarians by Jim Kutzia, Kindred by Octavia Butler. I reread all of those in the last couple of months. So there it is. Um this is also available to rewatch, just so you know, if you need a uh, title catch. Um, Rachel is curious about um, uh, Nora's sister. Um, excuse me, I have her name. Uh, Salma. Salma. Mm -hmm. um, that we didn't really get to know her, or, or uh, Rachel thing, you know, curious about who she was, because especially towards the end of the book, like we really start to see into her world, are you interested at all in writing more about Salma? Uh, no. <laughs> I um, One of the things that happens uh, to me anyway when I'm working on a novel is that my mind starts to run on two tracks. One is like my real life mm -hmm. and the other one is the novel. And it's kind of like I'm always thinking of it at the back of my mind. And um, that process sort of continues even when the book is still like in copy edits and you know like that you know tours all the way until when the book is no like there's no changes possible that said the book is now in print and then once once that happens and another novel sort of like starts I I don't feel that um need to return to the same characters at least I haven't felt it so far with the books that I've written with respect to Sama, I wrote only the one chapter and about her, and I wrote it from the second person because she's somebody who has suffered from so much pressure, you know, from her parents and from um, sort of the world in which she lives, where she felt like she had to work so hard to fit in. And I think it really kind of created a sort of dissociation. And I thought, oh, it'd be interesting to try and do that in the second person. Mm -hmm. And once I wrote that and having already written about uh, some of the sort of the dysfunction in the family, I felt like I had done enough of that. And I, I had um, built the story in a way where I had explored what I was interested in. And so I felt like I didn't need to do more than that. Um, I also didn't want to create a perfectly symmetrical book. I wanted to yeah. you know, give live leave some things uh, open and um, open to interpretation and open for people to wonder precisely these questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Adam was wondering, and maybe in some ways you started to mention this actually already, <clears throat> um, but growing up in Morocco, how and why did you get involved in writing and more specifically writing books? Well, I would say that it, it grew out of my love of reading. I, uh, I grew up in a house full of books. My, my parents were always reading all the time, every day. At the time, you know, so I mentioned Morocco in the 1970s, there was one TV channel uh, and there was one radio channel. They were the official uh, state channels. And it really wasn't until the mid 80s that we started having a second channel. And then the satellite revolution happened in the 90s. Yes. And then it was an explosion of channels. And now you can't like there's like 300. But at the time, it was extremely regulated. This was the Morocco of King Hassan. And so like media was really tightly controlled. So really, if you turned on television, you were going to see the news, the King's speeches, you know, stuff like that. And at night there would be movies, but you know, it's a long day, so there's nothing else to do. So my yeah. parents were always reading and uh, they didn't go to college. So I don't want to give the impression that they were, you know, cracking open, you know, Foucault or, you know, Derrida or anything like that. But it was that just genuine love of reading that they passed on to us. And so I started reading from a very young age. And I think at some point around the age of nine, I think out of that love of reading came the urge of telling a story and being read. So it really grew out of being a reader. Um, and um, to, to answer the question about, you know, sort of, wanting to write a book more than just the story which is what you write when you're age nine and you think it's <laughs> it's, it's a book so you know you start with you know started with with short stories and then yeah. you know, over the years bigger and bigger things until uh i started working on a, a novel um and i didn't really it was for me it was always something that i was doing on the side my parents did not encourage writing uh, as a as a hobby, fine. They loved it, just not as something that you would do uh, as a profession. That's so probably I, because they loved you, right? <laughs> for sure. <Yeah>. For sure. <laughs> um, but so it really took. I, I really didn't myself take it seriously until I was in my twenties uh, and I was in graduate school, and I was like, "Oh my God, is this all there is to life?" You know, just all this research my field was linguistics was this you know is, is this all there is to life just like all these research papers and conferences and teaching and the world of academia and it just seemed just that it didn't while it was intellectually satisfying it just wasn't um rewarding it just wasn't mm. as enjoyable and as fun it just didn't give me as much joy as i would have wished to have from something that I did every day and what the joy that I had was from writing stories. And so it wasn't really until I was in my mid twenties that I really started to get serious about writing and finish a book draft and try and put it out into the world. Mm. Um, is there, you had, you had mentioned in one interview that I watched that the, the books to be read show up when they do there's not like a right time, they just kind of appear when they do. Uh, do you feel the same way for uh, writing? Because in our head, a lot of times we're like, oh, I'm such and such age, I'm far too young or too old to begin writing. Do you feel the same way about writing that the stories come and that you should just go in when they come out? Uh, I have learned that. It wasn't something that I, I necessarily uh, thought years ago, but I have learned that it is true that you really, every project that you um, that you believe in, it doesn't matter how long it takes. Nobody, the, the outside world doesn't care whether you write <laughs> or whether you publish or what you do with your life. Nobody cares. It's you, you're putting that pressure on yourself. So you need to just, you know, enjoy the time that you have with the book. Uh, and there is I really have learned to enjoy the the writing part of the process more than anything else. It's just, it's what I enjoy doing. It's why I got into writing. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that, you know, books are late or like you have to rush a book because otherwise there's going to be a window of opportunity. And if you miss it, that is sort of like capitalistic 
uh, framing that it's best to avoid when when you're really thinking about your art and, and what you're doing with it. So uh, try not to think too much about that and focus instead on the project. Yeah, that's, that's great <laughs> advice. I'm glad you said that. Um, uh, what uh, Liz was asking about the Mojave Desert as it comes up in the other Americans and what is your connection to that place in, in your life? Like it plays a particular character in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's weird because I have lived in, in Los Angeles almost, almost 30 years and I had only, I've only started going out to Joshua Tree in the last, I would say, 10 or 12 years. And it was, it's just two hours uh, from where I live, but it was very, very strange why I had never been there. And then I went there once and it was a revelation. It was just so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it actually came as a surprise to me that I enjoyed it so much because I've always thought of myself as a big city person. I've never lived anywhere but in big cities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought I enjoyed sort of like that urban jungle and the noise and the cars. Like I thought that that's what life was like. And then I went out into the desert and I thought I found out that I loved it. I loved the silence. I loved uh, the landscape. I just loved how quiet and peaceful it was. Yeah. And so I just kept coming back and coming back and coming back. And when the time I uh, came to write this book, I wanted to sort of give myself the gift of living in that world. <laughs> and so I, that way I get to spend four or five years with it. And that's what I did. So I put it in the book and I got to have an excuse to visit it all the time and yeah. to turn it into a character in the book. Um, yeah. There is something deeply magical about getting in touch with the land and the thing that um, <clears throat> not too long ago, like occurred to me is a very obvious thing, very simple thing, but it finally sunk in that we will become the land. And that oh, really yeah. has completely, like we are very much. So it isn't this distant sort of green nouveau ecological thing, like very literally I will be the land and very literally my ancestors are the mountains, are the sea. And being in the land, you know, being in the land this way um, allows, sort of frees me from like, I don't know what, uh, Disney dogma or whatever of Pocahontas as much as I always <laughs> cry when I hear Color of the Wind. Like, it <laughs> took something away from me, didn't allow me to connect with. But I'm really happy to hear that you're spending time in and on the land because there is something deeply grounding, pun intended, and sacred about that practice, whether or not that's something you even grew up with. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I think for me, when I was uh, working on the previous book, that's when it really my interest in the natural world, like deep interest grew out of that because uh, I had to travel to it's a historical novel. Um, well, we talked about it. But anyway, so <laughs> yeah, more so, account you're so, referencing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so yes. And so then I had to travel to all the places where the book uh, was set. And it just really hit me that Every time you look at a mountain or like an old tree, that that mountain has been there way longer than it's going to be there long after you die. And yeah. it has seen so many generations of humans that have stood before it and looked at it. Yeah. And that has always sort of connected me with mortality and how um, we worry about way too much stuff that we shouldn't worry about. And, and so I think it's really good to have that connection with the land. And so, you know, with, with the other Americans, I wanted to, because I enjoyed that landscape so much was my number one reason for putting it in the book. Mm -hmm. But then there was also a narrative reason, which is that this book wouldn't function in a big city just because a big mm. city nowadays has so many surveillance cameras has so many you know like if you're doing a hit and run in a you know empty road it's not going to take it's not going to be that difficult to solve i would imagine given the way given how uh, prevalent surveillance has become and also how many people are around at all times and yeah, uh, yeah. so and and you wouldn't see the impact because in big cities people are so often strangers to one another yeah, and yeah. so you know setting it in a small town in the desert made more sense so for it's you know a bit of personal reason a bit of narrative reason that the book ended up being set 
in Joshua Tree. This um, question from Chris as we're coming to our closing of the questions. What do you hope readers ponder as they close the final pages of The Other Americans? Do you have anything that um, you want them to take with? Yeah, I would say the thing that I think comes across for me with this book when I, when I wrote it is how limited our perspectives are, our hmm. personal perspectives are. Um, and we think, we think we know people, oftentimes we don't. We think that we understand an issue, oftentimes we don't. Our, our perspectives are limited. And I think it's, it's an important thing to remember on a daily basis that um, we're not seeing the full picture, that there's different, different sides um, to, 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 to any story and that people bring their um, private experiences to bear on how they're looking at a particular event. Man, thank you so much. I'm so glad you decided to write. <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate it. One more uh, placement marketing. Yes, yes. <laughs> Bend, Oregon, I know Central Oregon. Oregon, I know that you love the land. And then I also know that you, you like to tell people that you're woke. So you <laughs> want to you read that one too then. Really appreciate your time. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Jason and Layla, for just an amazing conversation. That was, I'm sitting two feet away from Jason. I wish I just had some popcorn and sat and ate it, but I probably would have disturbed you. Um, <laughs> you would have thrown it. And thank you all to all our loyal Novel Idea participants uh, for making this such a wonderful event for 18 years. Uh, keep on reading. Let's make this another great reading year. And thanks for making this the largest community read program in the in the Northwest. Um, stay healthy. Be sure and visit your library. We are open and we're ready to serve you. Have a great evening.